Welcome to the Science Business Network. This is Richard Hudson. Well, it's official. Horizon 2020, one of the biggest research programs in the world, is now beginning. It's 79 billion euros of funding for scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, and students across the EU. And to, as it begins, I'm joined by Moriga Gagan Quinn, the author, one of the authoresses of this program, the EU Commissioner for Research, Innovation and Science. Commissioner, um, why is it important? Why is Horizon 2020 important? Well, first of all, I think the really important element of Horizon 2020 is that we have grand societal challenges out there that we have to face, we have to find solutions to, whether it's food security, energy security, uh, health, um, all of the various elements that are there. And we have to find solutions, so we have to invest. It's important because research and innovation provide the competitiveness in our economy, which for Europe is really important at the mm -hmm. moment. It w that will give jobs and growth. And for all of the member states, they need that at the moment. And also it's very important from the researchers point of view and um, they need funding, particularly at a time when several member states are reducing funding or not increasing funding as they should. So they're turning more and more to the European Union. And it's also important for business and for industry um, to be able to come back to the programme. We lost a lot of industry from for FP7, FP6. We want to see industry really back in and that's why we've done a lot of changes in the programme to encourage that to happen. And, and what do you think is the, um, comparing it to the prior research and programmes of the EU, what's the most important difference, do you think? Well, I think immediately when you look at Horizon 2020, you will see that it's radically simplified. This is the first thing. It's a much bigger program, obviously, divided in three pillars. So very unlike what we had before. We have a pillar for excellent science. We have a pillar for industrial leadership. We have a pillar for the grand societal challenges. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge based approach, something we didn't have before. And um, for me, the biggest criticism I got from the very beginning in relation to FP7 is too complicated. There's a huge administrative burden. Why would I bother if I'm a small academic uh, institute, a small university, a small company? Um, what, would I, what would I gain from getting involved other than getting wrapped up in a whole lot of red tape? So we've radically simplified the programme. And I think that's something that so would be welcome. Simplification, just yes. on that. So what is that going to mean in... And specifically, is it going to be quicker to find out whether you're going to get a grant? Is it uh, less paperwork? I mean, yeah, well, starting off, less paperwork. Mm. Um, um, a lot of what we're going to be doing is going to be um, not in paper anymore, but indeed um, uh, electronically done. I think that's very important. We yeah. have one program now for research and innovation all under Horizon 2020, whereas we had several little programmes before. Um, we're going to have um, uh, less uh, paperwork, less audit, because we have uh, redressed the balance between trust and control, which I think was very important. Uh, we have a single set of rules, interpreted right the same way all across the system. Uh, under the Common Support Centre, we have uh, uh, IT is going to be uh, serviced by DG Research and Innovation. So a lot of innovations taking place in Horizon 2020, which is to the benefit of getting more researchers, more okay. innovators, more small companies so then involved. So one difference is simplification. Simplification then. is a huge difference. Is, is there another really important thing for people uh, very I much? Think, I think uh, <clears throat> that there is in that, um, in the industrial um, leadership pillar, for example, we're going far closer to market. We are supporting and funding uh, prototypes, uh, demonstrators, uh, all of the areas that are very important if we want to translate science in Europe into innovation, right. if we want to bring it to the marketplace, which is a big criticism. Uh, and has been a criticism for a long time. So if we want to do that, we have to fund riskier research and we have to go closer to the market. How, uh, then on that point, then, how will 
you, that's a different kind of project, a different kind of evaluation than mm -hmm. has been done in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you going to be sure that you're picking the right kinds of projects then? Well, I think what's very important for us is that we don't pick winners. We've never done that. Right. But member states, I think, uh, need to look at where their, area, their areas of strength are and they need to invest in those areas and that investment will be backed by the European uh, programme. Um, I also think that if you look at, and, and the other major difference is, if you look at all the way from the setting up of the advisory groups to the evaluators to the assessors, all the way through, we have um, encouraged new people to come on board. We don't want to have this reputation maintained that we've had in the past, that it's a kind of a closed shop, that you know all the evaluators know each other, the yeah. advisory groups are all confined, that it's a kind of a closed shop and you can't get involved. So um, in the advisory group, for example, we launched a call, we asked right. everybody, we advertised it and said, come on in, we want as broad um, a church as possible to be involved, uh, and a research church, an innovation church, uh, we also want to make sure that new people come um, and uh, we want everybody to get involved so that we want gen a gender balanced approach, which we will have now right the way through from the advisory groups all the way to the very end. So I think that's all change that was necessary and that will be welcomed. OK. And the, but looking at the different parts of the programme, is there, is there a particular part of it that you like best? I mean, you said the simplification is important and the broadening is important, mm -hmm. but I mean, what's cool? I think risky research is very cool. I think what we're doing with the European Research uh, Council is very important. Mm. Um, I think the ERC is now regarded as the benchmark for excellence, not just in Europe, but all over the world. Uh, for a European uh, Institute of Research or a university to have an ERC grantee is their badge of honour. Every university wants to have an ERC grantee and they're yeah. all working towards having that. Um, so for me, investing more and almost doubling their budget was very, very important. Um, <clears throat> doing a lot for researcher mobility to um, encourage researchers to be able to travel. The Mary Skłodowska Q reactions obviously are very important from that point of view, also from a training point of view. Um, and what we're doing for the global challenges, I think, is very interesting. That's okay. interesting, now, again, not just from a European point of view, because these challenges are challenges for every country in the world, every continent in the world. So I think what we're doing there in the area of health and energy and food, in um, marine, in security, all of those areas are really, really important. OK. All right. But is there something that you don't like about it? It's an odd question, but I mean, you know, there were zillions of ideas that, of course, in the cabinet and in the DG mm -hmm. when planning it, things that you wished would have got through. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I suppose you never have enough money, even though I'm very proud of the fact well, that 79 billion isn't time, bad. it's you know? a good amount of money Compared and one of what, the 54? biggest in the world. Yes. Yeah. And, and when, you, when you actually look at that very seriously and you realise that the overall budget of the EU was slashed yeah. by the member states and yet within that the budget for Horizon 2020 uh, was increased by almost 30%, I think that's a tremendous result at the end of the day. Are there things that we would have liked to um, have done? Of course there are. Are there things that uh, we could have done if we got more money? Of course we could have looked at more researchers, we could have funded yeah. more projects, we could have done a lot more in a whole lot of different areas. But at the end of the day, I think you have to make choices. Um, and I think the choices that we've made was a were a response to the criticisms that were levelled at us at the very beginning. And don't forget that while it has taken two years for the sort of the legislative process to go through from the day we proposed Horizon 2020 first to this week when the Council of Ministers actually um, mm -hmm. supported uh, what we did and adopted it, we had a year before that when we consulted widely with all of the stakeholders. So I met all of the research organisations, I met uh, innovators, I met the representative groups of all the different types of universities and academic institutions. <clears throat> I met businesses, I met large companies, I met the SME representatives all around the 28 member states and beyond. And they all had messages. They had, the main message they all had was, it's too complicated. You have to simplify it. Right. You have to make it easier. 
business set, we want to come back into the program. But if we're a small or medium-sized enterprise, we don't have a separate part of the company that deals with administration. So therefore, our bureaucratic burden must be reduced. Um, other people said there's too much audit. It's a heavy burden on all of us. So we need less paperwork. We need to make it friendly for right. us to come back. And I think we've delivered on but, that. But, but since, since the details of the program have come out, one criticism that has been, uh, uh, that we've often heard, is that it seems to be scattered. You know, so many different uh, action lines in the program, so many different, uh, something for everybody, as mm -hmm. it were. Uh, whereas, particularly uh, from the big companies, one often hears, well, there should be focus, you know, concentration of funds and fewer, more important mm -hmm. things. So, I mean, how do, you, how do you feel about that balance between, you know, concentration and... Well, I feel happy that... Um Everybody is unhappy in a way because <laughs> people are. Some people are saying it's too specific. Yeah. Other people are saying it's not specific enough. So that, to me, kind of sounds like we got the balance right. There are no little boxes anymore, you know. So to say that it's scattered, I'm. I'm not sure that actually stands up when you look at the program itself. Before this, every discipline knew exactly where to go. Yeah. Now they realise they all have to step out of their comfort zone. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, but 40 in the social sciences, I mean, there was an event here just last night, uh, 43 Shades of Social Sciences, in reference to the 43 action lines uh -huh. in, uh -huh. in that program. Uh -huh. So, uh, But I think, I think um, you know, the criticism I got from the social scientific community originally was, you know, we've, we've a small program yeah. in the framework programmes up to now we want to maintain that and my view in relation to that is if you look at this excellent science pillar the first pillar so if you look at the ERC in particular uh, almost a billion or maybe a little bit more than a billion extra funding for social science than they ever had before so, but yeah. on top of that they have funding in the um, uh, social or the societal challenges pillar, huge funding, where again I'm encouraging them to step outside their comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the industrial leadership pillar, companies are saying we're developing things. If you look at the automobile industry or you look at the aviation industry, they're saying we're developing a lot of things that are going to be different. We need to understand what our customer wants okay. and whether there will be acceptance from the customer. And to do that, we need the social scientists. Okay. So it's a question of, you know, not staying pigeonholed in the same area, but being prepared to be bold and brave and step outside. And I think that's what we're asking everybody to do. Okay. The, um, the w one other point that I've heard talk about is the SME program. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge effort. Yes. I mean, I think it's what, the, in the end, it's eight and a half billion euros yes. is supposed to go to small and medium-sized yeah. companies. That's a big ask for the Commission because you haven't done SME work on that scale before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, is, there's a risk. I mean, how do you attract them and then how do you, if you have too high a rejection rate in the mm -hmm. end, you could also turn them off. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Well, we had a target of 15% in Framework Programme 7 and yeah. we surpassed that target. So I think that having a target of 20% is very realis realistic in Horizon 2020. Um, I think, first of all, for the SMEs, the biggest complaint they had was administrative burden, you know, red tape everywhere. We're not going to come to the yeah. programme if you don't do something sure. about that. And we certainly have responded to that in a very radical way. I also think that getting them to work with bigger business, getting them to work with academic institutions is really, really important. And when I go around to member states and I see what actually is happening on the ground, where you now have, in some member states for the first time, academic institutions realising we have to respond to the needs of industry. If we're going to do yeah. that, we have to talk to industry. So they're talking yeah, together. I mean, yeah. I think a wonderful thing would be if, if we could have it, would be if it was a natural thing for academics to move between academia and industry and for that to happen very naturally and to have people from industry moving into academia and moving back into industry. I think that would be a great thing if we could allow that to happen. We're setting the uh, architecture uh, for that to be able to happen. But at the end of the day, it's going to be up to those who work in academia and those who work in business as to whether that happens or not. But that would be an ideal opportunity. That's something that happens in the United States quite naturally. So that's something that perhaps seven years from now you would like to see 
was an accomplishment. I'd be delighted Horizon, if that happened. Yes. That, yeah. yeah, I think it would be really good if, if that could happen. Um, but I also think that that requires... Um, you know, people doing what I said a minute ago, which is, you know, stepping outside their comfort zone and realising they have to work together. And if we're to find um, solutions um, to the societal challenges that are out there, that definitely is going to have to happen because you have to work with industry and industry is going to have to work with you. OK. Is there... Is there how will you know that this worked? Seven years <coughs> in 2020, Horizon 2020. <laughs> Did it work? I don't know where I'm going to be, first of all, in 2020. <laughs> let's hope I'm still on the planet. Let's, I'll be much older than what I am now, so let's hope that the uh, challenge no, on health... 2020 is going to solve the ageing problem, right? <laughs> yes, well, that's what I'm hoping, yeah. that it's going to do this. Um, I think there are a lot of um, uh, challenges um, out there, whether it's, you know, we have a huge energy challenge at the moment, we have a huge food security issue at the moment. Uh, we uh, Ageing, healthy ageing is going to be very, very important. We're going to live much longer. We need to be able to, for that life to be much healthier than it is now so that we can maintain a, a really good lifestyle. Um, so I'm hoping that the money that is being invested in these societal challenges will make my life better as I grow older. But much more importantly than that, I think it's important that we give hope to young people mm -hmm. who at this moment in time either have no jobs or have a qualification that is no longer uh, attractive uh, for them to get a job. So <clears throat> I'm hoping that, you know, what we're doing in Horizon 2020 will have changed that landscape for them. I also hope that many, many more young people will have chosen to go into a scientific career. Because for us, that's where the jobs are going to be. That's where the highly skilled, well-paid jobs are going to be. That's where I want to see my grandchild, for example, and I'm sure everybody else would like to see their children and their grandchildren going into an area where they will have job security right. at the end of the day. That job security doesn't mean, in my mind, staying in the same job forever. It means being able to take your qualification with you and decide, this year I'm going to work on whatever the project might be, in Germany, for example. Uh, in two years' time, I'd like to move on and I'd like to try to bring that skill with me to work in a different member state. But I would like to see them doing it within the 28 member states of Europe. Okay. Um, I would like to see the young people that I've been meeting in the United States, for example, or in China, Euro young Europeans, who say, particularly those of them in the United States, will say to me, I would like to come back to Europe, but I can't come back because I don't have a proper career structure in Europe. That's a matter for the member states to be able to set that kind of career structure that they have in the United States so that a scientist mm -hmm. or a researcher is clear that when he or she comes back, she or he will know uh, where they're going. So that means open, transparent and merit-based recruitment in all of our member states. We have it, thankfully, in the majority of member states. We don't yet have it in all 28. So that's why I'm saying to the member state governments, you need to invest in research and innovation strongly. You need to transform your um, research and reform it, your research landscape. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and there's a lot of work to do in a lot of member states still in that area. OK, well, <clears throat> big ambitions uh, for this program. But m my last question is simply, uh, let's get back to the to uh, what many people uh, are concerned about is how do they get the money? Mm -hmm. So. The calls are opening. Yes. Uh, they run until the first call is going to run until when? February, March. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so, do you have first of all? Do you have any idea how many people are going to be applying? Well, if uh, it's if the inquiries that are being made at the moment are anything to go by, I think we'll have an enormous number of people who want to apply. I think, first of all, their first port of call is to their national contact points in the member states who will absolutely know all about the areas that will be involved in the first call and also how they go about applying. But equally, I think that so they will be pleasantly surprised with the participant portal uh, because it's going to be a much more user-friendly participant portal. I'm, 
very privileged that I've seen it in action. Okay. And um, for me, it's like um, any of the good search engines that are out there at the moment where you can put in a word or a sentence and you get a big menu uh, that comes up. You will have the same thing in Horizon 2020. Yeah. So if you are, for example, Rich, you're um, um, a social scientist right. and you're interested in seeing in the first calls where are the opportunities for social science in this? You just put that in and you get a menu of all the different areas where social science will have a home or will find a home in the first set of calls. So, and where, where is this uh, portal going to live? The portal is going to live in DG Research and Innovation, but the portal, like any portal, will be wide open yeah. to all of the participants. They just go on to the website and then they go into the uh, participant so portal. ec.europa.eu. Exactly. And, yeah. and instead of you know having all this paperwork that they had to do before, they can now do it electronically. It's okay. much shorter. Uh, it's much clearer, much simpler, and at the end of the day, I think, and we've been testing it up to now, and the response <laughs> this is... This isn't Obamacare we're talking no, about No, here. It's okay. no, it's not. No, no, no. We've been testing, we've been testing this, and um, uh, we've had a very, very good response from people who say that much simpler, much easier. Uh, we have a help desk, obviously, which is very important, yeah. uh, so that if people run into difficulties or if they're not quite sure, uh, that at least they're the help desk that can help them and support them. We have a common support centre, so DG Research will be responsible for uh, IT, will be responsible for the audits, will be, you know, so the research family of commissioners will be much more cohesive uh, as a unit. So it's all about simplification, radical simplification, making it easier. And of course, the time to grant has been cut down significantly, so people will get their money faster. Uh, uh, time to grant, so... Do you have a target for that? We do. We have a, an eight-month target. Eight-month target, okay. Um, and uh, we want to see um, um, researchers and scientists getting their money faster, which okay. is, at the All end right. of the day, what we need. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, congratulations. It's off on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, you are about to be inundated with applications, <laughs> I think. Hopefully. Hopefully. Well, hopefully, <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining the Science Business Network. All right.